Let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, we do have a quorum. Um, and um, first, is there any public comment items not on the agenda? All right. I'm not seeing any. Uh, we'll move on to the EPA minutes of November 25th that were included in your packet. Um, Okay. All right. I, I wonder, um, we, we don't have our note taker. Can you? Okay. It was moved by Supervisor Krause and seconded by um, Supervisor McCarville. And that's the minutes of November 25th. Any dis, uh, discussion? Um, Supervisor Can. I wanted to note, at least in the copy that I see on my store, uh, the minutes don't seem to reflect the edits that we discussed in the last meeting. So, so I don't know if that should be the whole copy of the on my store or. Um, okay. Um, yeah, Supervisor Ken, yeah, why don't you look at the one that was in the packet and see? Uh, no, this one does not have to be correct. All right, well, um, should we go through the corrections again to the minutes of November 25th? I think that would be the most expeditious way to do them. Do you remember what they what, what they were? Um, I do know that um, Amelia Maurer specifically got contact to say that she was speaking. She did not speak, but she registered in opposition. She's just speaking in support. I also believe we discussed that nobody actually did speak explicitly in support, so I'm not sure if that's the proper place to put those two. If they need to be, they're not fill up the sheets correctly or anything. Uh, since we have a category of people who submitted registration slips that we seem to be not sure of exactly where they fit in, that might be a good place to put them. Um, and I just know that there were a couple of people that talked to me um, about um, being put in the wrong place, uh, for instance. I believe uh, Lenore Hansen and Heather Rosenfeld, who were not put in just the category of submitted registration, so both registered explicitly in opposition. And, uh, and finally, I think Awa Fofana is listed uh, as is, uh, is supposed to be speaking in uh, opposition. Supervisor Pan, I hate to ask this, but we've been having trouble getting these corrections. Yeah. Would you mind sending an email? Yeah, and I think and I have before, so I can do something. Okay, why don't you resend the email um, to, do you know Stephanie? Mm -hmm. Okay, resend it to Stephanie. And I can you please, because um, I get all these notes down and it's just so chaotic. Yeah, yeah. and then um, should we wait till the next meeting to approve them? I think we should. Um, so um, let's, yeah, motion to table, Krause um, and McCarville. All in favor of tabling the minutes of November 25th, please say aye. Aye, those opposed, okay, the minutes are tabled. Uh, what about December 9th? Um,
then it's as corrected by indicating that the Safe Communities Coalition presentation was not given. And it's moved by Supervisor Willett and seconded by Supervisor Krause. Any more discussion on the minutes? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no? Okay, minutes are approved. Um, okay, we don't have any fund transfers. We have Mickey Beal here. Mickey is our, um, everybody knows Mickey, maybe not in the audience, but Mickey is our, are you actually our lobbyist? Or legislative our, lobbyist. Legislative lobbyist. And she's going to go through the, um, the uh, platform that Dane County has. So, um, Mickey, you want to come up and let's see if I can figure out how to turn you on. Um, I do have extras if anybody needs, would like to hand out. I have some up here. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Mickey Beal. I'm the legislative lobbyist for Dane County. And I'm here with the legislative agenda, Resolution 355, which um, has been traveling through all the standing committees. Um, I do have extra handouts of the agenda and my other um, information if anyone is interested. Um, um, I'll just start out with, real briefly with this, uh, with the pictures. I thought you might want to see the newly elected um, freshman legislators for this session. And the new ones in Dane County are second to the last in the first row. Representative Dave Considine, Considine replaced Representative uh, Clark. Um, and then on the back side, um, Representative Lisa Subic, the second to the uh, first, the second in on the first row, replaced Representative Brett Holsey, and then um, on the back side, uh, third to the last, is Senator Janice Ringhan, and she replaced uh, Senator Cullen. So Senator Ringhan, uh, Representative Subic, and Representative Considine are the new members in terms of the Dane County Legislative Delegation, and then in the uh, rest uh, these are, this is the entire freshman class for the Senate and the Assembly. So I just thought I'd share that with you so you can see who is new to the legislature after the November elections. Before you, I did leave at your seats the Dane County Legislative Agenda, and I would just like to walk you through uh, to highlight some of the points. Um, there's a new section in the agenda, some of you have been here before probably notice it. Um, we have a new uh, a section called uh, Eliminate Racial Disparities, and this was put together uh, uh, after meeting with a whole bunch of different people um, to take items that were in the agenda and compilate them under this new section. So these are all items that were in the agenda, but they're all uh, put together in this new section. And I'll just walk you through some of them. Um, the juvenile justice and career development for youth are both targeting um, young people who need um, uh, programming and services to help them move on to careers or high school or further education. And both of those um, items um, will lead, hopefully lead um, students in that direction. Also, there's always, um, the first item is always asking for increased money 
for um, intervention and intensive treatment services for our young uh, uh, people who have tangled into the uh, court system. Uh, early Childhood Initiative is, some of you may have, have known about this for a number of years, but the Early Childhood Initiative um, is, uh, provides funding for in-home visits, for um, parent, uh, helping parents find work, and to create a stable uh, home environment as possible for newborns and young children. And so um, we also have the Early Childhood Zones, which are a complement to that. And I know you adopt, that's been a part of our budget. And so that's another program. And the hope with all that is to give um, babies and uh, young children as much uh, preparation as possible for their school careers and for the careers. And for those of us with gray hair, we know, we've seen the studies, that early childhood um, leads children on you know, the best path possible uh, in terms of their future and into adulthood. Apprenticeship and internships would uh, cover unemployed um, post high school students, students who have graduated and still have not found employment. And so the hope with that is to create more programs to target um, that population. The 17 year olds is probably of the biggest issue, and for those of you who are new to the board and not aware, under uh, current law, 17 year olds, violent and nonviolent, um, uh, with nonviolent and violent charges, are um, eligible to be sent to the adult prison and adult correctional system. So we have 17 year olds in the adult prison population, and there is a movement in the legislature, it's bipartisan to bring the, at least the nonviolent 17 year olds out of the adult prisons and then bring them back into the counties for the support services that they so you know, need. So that has been um, an ongoing, it hasn't been introduced yet, but meetings have been going on throughout the summer to try to make this happen. And it just doesn't make sense to, um, have any of you seen how young a 17 year old or Yes. A 17 year old? Oh, I have. Okay. I mean, I think we think, I mean, they're very young, and to send them into the adult prison population is just, and they are in the adult prison population. They are not in a segregated unit, so. But you have, Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, the first one, when I went and sat with Court and Commissioner Moyer, the very first one, I, I thought, what is that 12 year old doing here? And he actually was 17. Um, so that's um, been a big focus. We've, we've averaged um, around between 13 to 51 cases like that in Dane County. Um, I know our judges are very, have been very um, attentive to try not to wave kids into adult court, but sometimes that but is uh, is difficult. my understanding at age 17 they don't have the option, it's automatic? Um, yes, unless unless the court waves different, but yes, it is automatic. 17 year old, doesn't matter if you were shoplifting, if you picked up a pack of gum at the PDQ in your neighborhood, it doesn't matter what you did, that is, that is a path to adult prison. Um, so that, this, this issue is very important right now. Um, countywide use, youth collaboration, um, you know, that this has been ongoing in terms of the gang task force, but now um, I know the county has approved and the board has approved the mental health task force, so it brings uh, professionals from all backgrounds together to try to tackle um, uh, mental health uh, issues in schools and other areas for uh, younger uh, citizens. Um, let me see what else might be of interest to you. Um, as you know, youth aids is an ongoing battle to get increase in funding. Uh, the legislature and the governor have uh, consistently cut youth aids, 
It used to be funded um, much higher, and now it, over the last like five, six years, the uh, dollars amount, uh, dollar amounts for youth aid have been cut consistently in each uh, budget. So the hope this time is, even with a two billion dollar deficit, is to try to see if money can be invested in youth aids, which also hopefully will assist in keeping kids out of the adult prison because Youth Aid funds a variety of programs for um, young people to keep them um, on, on a path of careers in school and so forth, and assistance. Um, relative uh, caregivers, um, there's continuation to make sure that they are adequately funded if they are um, taking care of their non-custodial um, children that they are um, have been given in, are in charge of. Um, something else that you're not going to find in this section but has been added by other committees is to oppose um, drug testing for food stamp benefits. As you know, I'm sure the governor will speak to it tonight in the state of the state, but the state uh, legislature and the governor want to do drug testing as a basis, um, as criteria for receiving um, food stamp benefits, but the Republican Assembly wants to go further. They want to require photo ID on every EBT card. Wow. They want to require that none of those cards, uh, re restrict use of those cards um, to casinos, liquor stores, and strip clubs. Love that. Um, they also want to restrict what food is purchased. Wow. They only want certain foods purchased with um, the with the card. Um, they believe that um, people who receive the card are buying too much junk food, so they should um, restrict what is uh, able to be purchased. Um, they also want to connect work time limits and then the drug testing to the benefits. And then another thing the Assembly Republicans would like to see is an annual benefit statement that would go out every year to every person who is receiving these benefits to show how much money the state has given them on an annual basis. So these are some of the things. Anyways, uh, in my journey through the standing committees, one of the standing committees did recommend opposing um, the drug testing as a basis for food stamps, so we will um, have a position. Also, another thing that's not in here that I want to bring to your attention is all the landlord-tenant changes that have been brought by the legislature that pretty much restricts uh, people's ability to rent or have rights um, under the law. And it also negated all local government um, ordinances that um, cover uh, landlord regulation. All that was negated. So one of the standing committees wants to um, uh, delete those new laws that restrict landlord uh, regulation and all the changes that were put forth in what is called the Landlord Tenant Reform Bill. Yeah. Um, dental access is another area um, that is a, a growing um, problem. I know we've seen a lot of commercials on TV about these new dental plan programs, but it's something uh, that people need to take more seriously because dentists uh, generally don't see people who are on medical assistance. I'm sure some of you have experienced this through your dental visits, but they it's not a regular practice of theirs to take medical assistance for um, people that are coming in to see them with um, for a checkup or other problems. So that, we would like to see more attention drawn uh, to uh, dental access, um, dental care access. All the voter registration changes, as you know, it's been a common uh, position of Dane County to oppose the voter ID law, to oppose the absentee hour uh, changes that were made, um, to oppose getting rid of same day voter registration which there, there, this continues to be uh, a priority of some uh, legislators, um, to um, uh, weaken the voter registration and voter laws to a point where um, it, you have to question the validity of 
voting in general. But anyways, we do oppose a lot, all, all, almost in fact, all the changes that have been proposed so far by the legislature or voted on in the past. Some of these are tied up in court right now, still. Um, the Regional Transit Authority was a way for people without transportation, even cars, bikes, bus, whatever, to get around. As you know, RTA was in place, it was moving along, <coughs> things were moving forward on it, and then the first budget bill under the new governor eliminated all RTAs. There were three RTAs that were passed, regional tran transportation authorities that were passed uh, in the state of Wisconsin, and the governor eliminated all three of the uh, RTAs that uh, were put, that were funded and moving along at um, a, a pretty um, good pace. This would have covered um, uh, commuter lines here in Dane County, commuter trains, and a coordinated bus, a multimodal bus uh, taxi system, uh, mostly dominated by a bus system, and of course, now that is not, um, it was eliminated from the, um, in the budget. <coughs> Another thing is um, probation and parole, looking at increasing the daily rate, um, it's kind of remained in the low 30 um, per day uh, reimbursement rate, and I think everyone would like to see it back up to where the state has always committed. They would pay the rate, which is over $40 a day, and so that is also an issue um, in terms of uh, probation and parole. Prisoner reentry. This is an area a lot of. Uh, people in our community and across the state don't generally take a close look at. But this is talking about helping prisoners get jobs and get um, assistance and coming back into their communities. Um, there are There is a uh, movement in the legislature through the speaker. The speaker um, is, may, is almost going to make this a priority to uh, look at funding work for prisoners who are being released. And um, he has he had personal experience with this over the Christmas holidays. And because of his experience, he would like to see more focus and more attention and funding put into this um, area. So um, we might see some changes in that regard. Um, minority um, outreach, uh, the state needs to do a better job and along and working along with Dane County at uh, making sure people are aware of all the programs that are available you know, to them, uh, whether it's um, related to mental health or other areas. And so we would like to see more responsibility taken to educate our citizens about what programs are available for them to take advantage of. Um, I already talked of a little bit on the income maintenance programs, um, the landlord regulation. A minimum wage, um, as you know, uh, in November, the voters approved uh, taking minimum wage to $10.10 an hour here in Dane County with a 73.4% yes vote and a 26.4% no vote. So the majority of Dane County residents and voters uh, want to see minimum wage increase to $10.10. Something that is happening over in the Capitol, last session, some of you may remember, we were talking about Dane County's living wage ordinance and how we pay $11.33 an hour um, to uh, require our contractors to pay that to their employees. Uh, there was a bill that would have negated our authority to do that. It did not, uh, it passed the assembly, but it failed in the Senate. But that is coming back this session, and it appears that it might um, pass this time. So it would take away Dane County's authority to uh, require a living wage of $11.33. So I just want to make you aware of that. This is uh, going to be, mm-hmm. Oh, that's in 
in the that's in the sub that you will be receiving. Yeah, because when this was put together, the vote hadn't taken place yet. But that information will be in there. Um, Medicaid expansion, as you know, uh, that was rejected by the governor, but the county board still continues to have a position uh, to, you know, suggest that the governor and his departments take advantage of the Medicaid expansion dollars because there's so many programs and things that can be done with this that, I mean, I think we would probably be the most creative county in the state to come up with ideas for this. Right, Lynn? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, county jail, I talked about the probation and parole uh, holds. Um, also, I know the sheriff is committed to um, looking at alternatives, um, treatment alternatives, and um, other incarceration alternatives. Um, and I know that will continue. And any, you know, we'll be supporting, as we have, um, increases. The, some of you may have heard of the TAD program. The TAD program in, received increased money this last um, session, but it will not go to counties that already get TAD funding. So we will not be eligible for that money. We're hoping there'll be a TAD increase next go around and that it would be made available to you know counties like ours that um, you know take advantage of the program. Court interpreters are pretty um, important um, uh, it, in regards to providing interpreters to everyone, whether they have the ability to pay or not. And I know Carlo knows a lot about this and um, it's just having a basic right for a person to have an interpreter available when they're going through the court system if they are not fluent in the English language. So we would support uh, continued and increased funding for that program. And just so you know, a lot of um, times legislators don't see the need for a program like that and think that like a private entity should provide interpreters to uh, people going through the court system. But it, it's best to have court interpreters um, that know the court system, know, um, know the lingo and the, um, you know, all the language as it relates to a different language, even beyond English in terms of the court um, discussions that occur. Um, and then last is um, the uh, Wisconsin Community Justice Reinvestment Act. And, um, that was a proposal that has been put forth uh, over the last two sessions. I don't know if it'll be introduced this session or not, but it's pretty self-explanatory. It um, wants to people to take a more serious look at treatment versus incarceration in the court system. Um, so, but it has not been successful um, in the in the last uh, couple of sessions. And then also, as you are aware, the voters approved Medicaid expansion, the acceptance of Medicaid expansion um, in this last election, and they, 81.7% uh, voted yes to um, take the Medicaid expansion dollars, and 13.3% voted no. Um, the rest of the sections, the next session deals, I'm not, I'm not gonna walk you through the whole thing, but it deals with criminal justice um, and public safety and it covers everything from EMS services to uh, conceal and carry or criminal background checks, um, the multi-line telephone system problem that uh, 911 centers, not only ours, but around the state, uh, run into, um, you have difficulties with, um, uh, mental health screens, uh, providing more funding for mental health screenings for inmates, um, in uh, within the local jail population and so forth. So I don't know how far you want me to go into. Another um, thing that was approved since you adopted the legislative agenda was legalizing marijuana. And so the voters of Dane County did approve legalizing marijuana with 64.5% yes votes and 35.5% no votes. So the voters of Dane County did approve the legalization of marijuana. Um, I, you know, I'd be happy to answer now, questions. Any, does anybody have any questions? I guess I have to do it. Do you see the price of Thank you.
you talked a little bit about the communication surcharge for 9-11 system. Can you uh -huh. talk about that a little? As I read this, it isn't very clear. Are we looking here to support legislation to put another surcharge on, or are we looking no, to get the surcharge? I think we're looking at recovering the money that was put in when the new surcharge happened. So the way that I money was supposed yes. to go to nine to well, our I, I know that and I would love to get that to our nine one one. I know, wouldn't it be nice? Yeah. But as I read this, it looks like what we're looking for is to have another tax on it. And that worded me in the wording of it. So can we can we fix the wording of that? And it also talks about removing the sunset clause within Wisconsin Act forty eight. What does that mean? Well uh, when Governor Doyle took the money, he put in a sunset Clause, which was, um, this should be updated. The sunset clause was, has since expired, so it's not even applicable anymore. Okay. So we could just even remove that so, statement. So could we fix all of number seven that says communication surcharge for 9 11 system mm -hmm. and change what the wording is and say redirect the money collected from the 911 center to the county? Something simple like that? That's very clear that um, says sure. we want the money. Do you want to say to me again and we'll Re redirect the, the surcharges currently charged and direct, direct surcharge. and direct the money directly to the county? I don't want the state to take it, I want us to get it. Okay. And that would take care of that Wisconsin, that sunset clause thing that was unclear, that would make that whole paragraph really clear of what we want. Okay, you want that added to it or do you want that to replace? I want it to replace because I think what's there okay. is really confusing. It looks to me like you want to tag another charter on it is what it's saying. Yeah. And I've, I've talked to you about it enough that I was surprised to read that. So I'd like to make it so that it's very clear that in okay. fact, we don't want another tax. We simply want the tax to go to where it's supposed to. Okay, so um, what, support. Um, it what line number is that just so we get it up here? That is line number 125. And the on page is, three. The heading is communication surcharge for 911 system, and it goes on for about five lines. Because this would simply state that we we want the money to come directly to the county. And we'll double check for the minutes. So can I reread it to you? Absolutely. Support legislation to redirect. Um, we should call it what it is. It's the uh, uh, communication surcharge because now it covers cell phones, Androids. Smartphones, VoIP, everything. Communication surcharge. Uh -huh. Good word. Support legislation uh, redirecting the communication surcharge uh, funding directly to counties. Perfect. I think that's clear and concise. That's what we like. Okay. And then can I go with another one? Sure. Well, on page five, under Veterans Services, number one, and there's clause there that says armed forces support the Dane County soldiers who are presently serving, which is a wonderful line. Unfortunately, then it goes on that it says support protecting families and jobs rather than utilizing precious resources and funds to wage war. That's kind of a shame that we have to tag in there not waging war when we're trying to support our veterans. I think that line is, is exceedingly tacky. I, I would make a motion to remove it from the point of supporting protecting families and jobs rather than utilizing precious resources and funds. We really like the point of, of course, supporting our veterans, which is what we all want to do. But we're just tagging a second sentence on there that is not doing okay. the same thing. Uh, this one might be controversial, so why don't we okay. um, make it into a regular motion. It's moved by Supervisor Willett. Is there a second to removing that sentence? Doesn't look like you have a second, but this does go to the executive committee, so you have another shot at it there. Okay. And the floor. Um, and then I would have further questions. If we wanted something deleted, is that done here, or is that done on the floor, or? It, it can be done here as okay. an amendment, or on the floor. Okay. I would make a motion to delete um, page lines 57 through 66 which would remove the sections about voter <coughs> registration, uh, election day voter registration, and the RTA. Okay. okay. We'll be deleting lines 57 through 66. Right. Is there a second to that one? That's under the racial disparity section. Um, yes, it is. Okay. And it would start with um, 
Okay, it's, it's the slides. Like, items 12 through 14 yeah. gets it exactly, but the, okay. the lines would be 57 through okay. 66. Vicki, we're going to vote on it. I, um, my sense is we need a second. Um, is there a second for that one? I'm surprised it will, I don't see a second. So, but okay. again, that's the. Okay. Uh, does anybody, uh, Supervisor Baer, see if I can figure out how to turn you on. Welcome, by the way. I would like this whole system. Now, if I can go back to 
a few more specifics. On page nine, it talks about state election law and it talks about reporting name and address of the place of employment on people under $100. It doesn't say what they want to set that to. I'm surprised to see that. And I would move to strike lines 434 through 436. This is simply a lot more reporting. Um, our clerk already has trouble with getting all of these things done. There are a lot of election reports, campaign reports that are not done properly now. There are reports that should be followed up on and aren't. Um, and the last thing we need is more things here, and especially places of employment. If someone's giving money, it shouldn't matter if they're placing employment. So okay. I'm all in support of that. Okay, we'll see if we can get a second on that one. That's on the top of page nine. Okay, it doesn't look like we have a second on that one. Um, you want to try again, Supervisor Willow? Do you have another one? You know, the agenda is a living, breathing document. There's things in here that were here way before I ever got here. I, I guess on the point that I'm not getting a second on anything, I won't waste any more of the committee's time. I will probably bring some items back up by the time this gets to the board floor. I suspect I can at least get a second on the board floor so that we can vote on this. Okay. Time. All right. Mickey, do we need to vote on this to forward mm -hmm. it? Um, um, you would. Um, Recommend approval as amended, I think is the... Uh, okay, that would get Supervisor Willett's, um, you got one in, you got a wording change. The 911. At the 911, yeah. Um, are we ready for that? I mean, um, we've had a fair amount of time here with Nikki, and we appreciate your thoroughness. So, um, Supervisor Pan, are you make? I mean, be sure. Go ahead. Um, well, just for future things, because I think you have know, yeah, numerous points that various supervisors here could go into about criminal justice system, especially as it's you know, very much in the forefront of our conversations. Uh, in the future, um, should we just get in touch with you about maybe other ideas or recommendations you might consider? Um, here's, here's how it works. Once the agenda is adopted by the board, then that's it. It won't be open uh, again until the next session begins, which is in two years. But resolutions are adopted during the interim, and so a lot of positions get taken on issues through resolutions. Anything with a legislative intent, that a resolution with a legislative intent usually gives direction to me on supporting or opposing or whatever the case may be. So if there's changes you want made, what happens is all those resolutions that are adopted during the period of time after this is adopted gets automatically enrolled in the new agenda that is developed when the next new session begins, which would be two years from now. I meant more in, um, for instance, like if I am thinking of privilege to bonus work before we get into these meetings, we talk about this meeting, but for instance, if I have had some thoughts about you know, if we want to take a position regarding the state's policies on, say, probation violations. Yes, the, the bill will continue its journey, the bill, the resolution will continue its journey. It, um, its, ne um, its next step will be personal finance and then executive committee and then it goes to the floor. So if there's, you know, you have those two committee opportunities, if you want to, I can work with you on wording if you'd like, um, if, uh, if, if you need assistance that way, but um, the, uh, those two committees still have to consider and take up the resolution, and then the final action is by the board on the floor. The, uh, what state is that the I don't know, because, for example, um, I never knew when I was coming here, so. Well, I um, tried. I know, but it's like, so, it, you know, usually we're wrapping things up, so personnel and finance, uh, if uh, also I have Ener tonight, so if Ener adopts it tonight, then the next step will be personnel and finance. If they don't, then I'll be s still an Ener. So. So I'm hoping if you want to certainly continue, but I guess uh, the marijuana issue seems pretty. Uh, it doesn't seem particularly. It seems pretty black and white in the sense that uh, if we could afford it exactly, that we would be minimum wage to that kind of those mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the sub, 
of Dan has been enrolled. So that is the Yes, because they were all adopted by the voters. So any referendum that were adopted by the voters, that's in the sub. Okay, um, Supervisor Baird. I was just going to respond to Supervisor Pan. If there's, yeah, you know, I'll take it upon myself to make sure this committee is aware of it when it comes to executive, and you know, if there's changes we need to make in executive, I do think it'll be easier to make changes on the committee instead of on the law. I'll work with that. Okay, thank you. Um, would somebody like to make a motion for um, adoption? Okay, it's moved by, as amended, um, yes. It's moved by Supervisor Baird and seconded by Supervisor Krause that we adopt as amended. Uh, and any discussion? Um, seeing none, all in favor please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 Yeah. Oh, got that? Okay. Mickey, thank you very much. We, we appreciate all your hard work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Okay, we have um, some resolutions that I don't think will um, take too long before we get to the big topic of the evening. Uh, first, we have resolution 448, authorizing acceptance of grant funds to administer funding for DayNet, who's been in my office for a week, not on this resolution, they're in our office building fixing our nearly crashed um, entire computer system. They're very good. Um, do we, yeah, it's moved by Supervisor Baird and seconded by Supervisor McCarville. The, the sheriff is here. Does anybody need to ask any questions on this one? This is an ongoing um, uh, arrangement we've had uh, with Dana for a number of years. Um, I'm happy to have the sheriff answer any questions if there are any. Um, doesn't look like there are any, so any discussion at all on this one? Okay, seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Okay, looks like that one passed unanimously. Uh, next one is 451, accepting exercise grant award for 2015 Madison Exercises. This is in, um, looks like Chief Tubbs is here, uh, Director Tubbs. We have a number of these. Um, you want to say a little something about all of them just to refresh everybody's memory? Or, yeah, come on up. Once again, is participating in the Verona Police Department, uh, Fitzroy EMS. 
that's Pittsburgh Fire, Pittsburgh TV as well. Uh, the city administration are embarking on a series of exercises. It took a little more finagling, but they've proven they've done it last year. They're going to do it again this year, running through a cycle of exercises from discussion based all the way up to moving fire trucks and personnel halfway across town to respond to a physical, physically, uh, physical example of a threat and to really make it happen. These exercises, there's no substitute for these types of exercises. To actually get the people together and focused on the issue. What these grants are providing is the money to help hire staff to help walk them through professionals who do this on a regular basis, and facilitate an exercise and ensure people, participants get out of it what they, what they need. So. Okay, thank you. Any, any questions for Jay? Okay. Um, why don't we, uh, you want to take all three of them together? Okay. Um, my, uh, Supervisor Willett. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Willett moves. Supervisor McCarvel seconds. Any discussion on these three? Say none. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Okay, those three pass. Um, we have the next one, Resolution 476. Authorizing to accept BAWA stop grant funds to continue the 0.5 FTE DD paralegal position in the Dane County District Attorney's Office. Uh, Marlis Howe, are you still here? Um, I don't see her. Oh, where'd she go? Um, okay, well, all this is is an uh, extension of it. Um, yeah, you know, it's in the budget. Okay, <coughs> Supervisor Baird moves approval. Supervisor McCarville seconds. Any discussion on this one? Um, there's Marlis. Um, seeing no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay, you just passed. <laughs> um, so, okay, you're very welcome. Thanks for being here. We appreciate it. You never quite know whether there's going to be questions or not. Okay, and um, the next one is back to the uh, sheriff. This one is resolution 490, authorizing a contract to provide three-way service team for the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. Seems to me we've had this one a zillion times. Um, Supervisor McCarville? Okay, moved by Supervisor McCarville, seconded by Supervisor Willard. Um, any discussion on this one? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Okay, that passes. Um, one more, um, back to emergency uh, management. Um, 493, authorization to approve purchase of services agreement for type three, formerly level B, hazardous materials response. Um, you brought Dave with you. Is he the expert on this one? Um, oh, oh, okay. Come on up. Come on up. You're here. Um, we've had this one before, too, but um, uh, tell us about this one. Again, I just want to point out that this is a, another uh, valuable dollars to the services and business that there's a hazmat situation in Dave County, as a part of the well, we are leaders, and I just want to get a big day and Dave Jay and Dave Bursack for taking leadership role on this one closely. And I'd really like to let my department uh, <coughs> members come up and speak so we have a chance of know them even better, know the work from all they want, mm -hmm. they do provide. So, thank you. Just uh, to shed some light on what that type 3 and level B is, uh, ha hazardous materials incidents used to be classified by the type of protective equipment that the responders needed. So the level B equipment, which was one less than level A, but it was basically a splash protection where level A is fully encapsulated. Now they're classified more by the types of materials that they're responding to. Um, so type three is industrial chemicals. Uh, type two would be unknowns. Type one would be uh, chemical weapons and that sort of thing. So that's what the distinctions are. Uh, Madison would be providing uh, type three service within Dane County, um, so they'd be able to respond out to other jurisdictions within, you know, outside of the city, but within the county to industrial and known as these Questions for Dave? Okay. Uh, ready for a motion? It's moved by Supervisor McCargo, 
Bill seconded by Supervisor Baird that we approve the discussion. Seeing none, all in favor please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Okay, that one passes. All right. Um, well, we're on to um, discussion, PPJ working group um, discussion regarding the jail studies. Uh, people who want to testify, um, you've been uh, filling out the blue slips. That's great. Marsh has been organizing them. And um, we're going to have um, a little um, uh, discussion among PPJ first. And then I, I know Supervisor Krause has to go to the Fitchburg Common Council meeting, so she's going to have to slip out a little bit after 7. Um, and unfortunately, Supervisor Shower had a work commitment tonight that he couldn't get out of. But I think the rest of us um, are here for the duration. So if you just bear with us uh, while we have um, our discussion, um, then we'll, when we're done with that, we'll move on um, to community comment. Um, we um, did a pretty good job, I think, of um, attaching some of the drafts that we have to the agenda so you can get an idea of where, um, where we're coming from. So let's open it up for discussion among committee members and um, who wants to go first? Supervisor Baird. Thank you. So Supervisor Penn and I um, sort of drafted up our notes and came up with, we're trying to do something a little different than usual, which is instead of simply introducing a resolution and having a public hearing and, and, and all of that, our goal was to sort of have a draft of our resolution here, you know, showing our notes a little bit, um, to have a discussion before it gets proposed so that maybe some kinks can be worked out um, and some ideas that perhaps weren't covered can be incorporated. So this is not meant to be exclusive. This is also not meant to exclude our colleagues on, the, uh, on pp and I don't think that we covered perhaps every idea that we have heard. We tried to cover the ideas that the two of us thought were important. And so that's the sheet that starts off with investigate the following. I forwarded to uh, Supervisor Rusk and he pointed out afterwards it would have been helpful if we wrote, this is a draft proposed by. So, um, sorry that that heading through the, through the procedure didn't, didn't make it on there, but this is uh, the origin of it for myself and Supervisor Pam. Um, that being said, I'm more than happy to talk in detail about them. Um, the idea was these are, the idea behind this was to incorporate it with other uh, proposals that have been written and drafted, i.e. this would be the start of the resolution. If approved, then we would investigate. So not, not understanding that we're never going to cover every detail and that in theory, each of these points is going to have a 30-month subcommittee investigation. So obviously, we're not going to encompass all the things that is going to be discovered within a three-month investigation, but it's hoping to give guidelines and philosophy of where we think the subcommittee would, would go. So we tried to give detailed knowledge, but obviously not all detail is possible. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll open it up to others. I'm more than happy to talk specifically through one through eight, but I don't necessarily know if that's requested or wanted by my colleagues. So I'll let them direct me as such. Um, Supervisor Krause. Thank you. I was just going to suggest, since we have many people in the room that are going to be really interested in this, why don't you just go through the eight points um, really quickly to say uh, what's in there for them. I'm more than happy to. I can sort of read the first sentence of each item. Um, and they're not necessarily ordered in grouping order. From, as we were talking with um, uh, uh, Madison Police Chief Koval today, we realized that mental health was in three different spots, not in a row, but there you go. Number one is mental health court, discussing the establishment of mental health court, be it one court or uh, something incorporated within multiple courts. Number two is um, specifically talking about alternative placements for youthful offenders. Under, it says under age 18, but of course under Wisconsin laws, 
under age 17, um, alternative placement besides the juvenile court. Um, number three is eliminating uh, the use of solitary confinement and determining what alternative space we need to create and study and establish so that solitary confinement is not utilized. Um, number four is um, grouping together alternative to and create incarceration programs. And you know, a supervisor, he's used to me talking first, because I, right? Even with an injury, I can't stop talking. Um, but Supervisor Pan hopefully will address this. This was something that he, he did a lot of review of, of the many, many studies we have had over the last few decades. And a repeating pattern was to house all of our alternative incarceration programs in one space. So that if you're in program A, and program A is not successful for you, maybe because it's too easy, maybe because it's too hard, maybe because it's a not a right match for the demographics and your gender and your race and the challenges that you face, then you can turn to your colleague that does alternative incarceration program two and say, I think this individual belongs with you. And that there can be an easier go-to instead of saying, mm, you failed my alternative incarceration program, there's the courthouse, see you there. Um, so that was sort of the concept behind that. Um, number five, um, this was part of the budget amendment, a stand-alone facility that serves individuals with mental health needs. Um, one, mental health needs that have nothing to do with the criminal justice system, that to acknowledge that we need more services, but two, um, one of the biggest comments that I got from police officers talking in the past few years was that they come across an individual, they feel like that individual is not okay to be left where they are, but they wish they could take that individual someplace else besides the jail. And they feel that they have a moral obligation, correctly so, to remove this individual from their setting, but wish there was someplace they could take them that isn't jail. So that's the concept behind that. Number six is um, initiative to decrease the average length of stay for those incarcerated in the jail. Um, prior to sentence and conviction, the whole gamut of that, signature bonds, revolving bail fund, weekend arraignment court. Number seven is specifically addressing the uh, emergency dire issues that we have in the current jail. Oh, I'm sorry, I think that's number eight, forget it. Number seven is a mental health crisis intervention team. Similar, um, Supervisor Rescue and I were talking about this, similar to the crisis intervention team that we have established in our public schools so that if a youth has a crisis, from during school hours, we have a team that responds to them. But when the youth has that crisis at two o'clock on a Sunday, we don't really have a team that responds to them. So trying to fill that gap. Uh, number eight is um, what I thought was number seven, the cost and requirements to address all safety and security concerns within the Dane County Jail. Um, and then we sort of had these two catch-all sentences at the end. I'll read them. All the above investigations shall prioritize needs of community of color especially African Americans due to their disproportionate numbers in our criminal system. Uh, we felt that was really important that we think there's a lot of good work that happens in Dane County by really well-intentioned and, and optimistic whites, myself included, and we need a perspective that is not mine. Um, then the second was echoing that. All outside RFPs or studies shall be awarded to entities that have an understanding of the impact of race discrimination as well as race plus poverty combined in Wisconsin and the United States. Um, so that was sort of our attempt to be comprehensive. Woo! Thank you.
to figure out if it is so necessary. Because for instance, I think the biggest statistic that I kept seeing in reviewing some of the studies, as you might have mentioned, was that uh, crime has been down for the past 10 to 20 years, um, and of course, and jail populations have increased. Right, it exactly. It seem uh, right to me, so it, it, doesn't, it just doesn't seem like that makes uh, particular sense. So uh, a lot of the studies specifically discuss that the reason for that is uh, length of stay. Um, so that's why we discuss, for instance, the uh, could uh, sheriff deputies uh, issue signature bonds so that while you're waiting for your essentially de facto signature bond, you're not in jail for those two days while you're waiting for a court case or things like that. So, uh, so those were where some of those recommendations came from. Um, additionally, um, you know, there's a, there's also a perspective, uh, one that I'm I sympathize with, which is that you know, for a lot of uh, these crimes committed, is jail really an effective way, an effective measure to prevent crime from happening to begin with? Uh, and is, does it put people in a position where they wouldn't end up in jail? Is it possible that a way to tackle jail overpopulation is as simple as not locking somebody up to begin with? Come on out. Um, so, so that's where that idea came from. Um, and that's why we discussed alternatives to incarceration programs that people can be taken to. Um, that uh, and so, for instance, I was actually um, I don't know if that person's in the audience right now, but I was actually very moved by a moment where she talked about uh, being sent to jail for uh, for stealing a ten dollar shirt, and uh, and nobody asked her once why she stole that shirt. And I thought I thought that was pretty telling to me about you know how did, how would jail have prevented her, have convinced her when she got out that she shouldn't steal a ten dollar shirt if you know like does it tackle the problem of why she stole a ten dollar shirt to begin with. So, so for me, that's where a lot of these ideas came from. Uh, there are a whole other host of you know issues and things that repeatedly come up in the various studies that we've had, and but um, these are the ones that are most relevant to you know uh, develop uh, possibly building a site such as a site to house alternative facilities, such as a house uh, site to house a day reporting center where, for instance, people in work study program or um, a work programs uh, can report to rather than having to sort of check back in at night in jail. Um, and uh, and so so these are the ones I thought were most relevant to the uh, eight million dollars we were going to discuss that we could uh, study with that money. There are other recommendations, but those probably fall under other areas. So, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Mike. Supervisor Willett. actually shows the population in 2004 and 1,053 is an average daily population with a length of stay of 22.8 days. In 2012, that number was down to 759 with a length of stay of 19.9. Not only is that down 28%, it's also down almost three days on length of stay. So to say that jail population has gone up it really does a disservice to our sheriffs. So if we could correct that first, the sheriff's done a very nice job of continuing to bring the population down and going up. So from there, I would like to, one, with, I appreciate this list and it since starts to put some things together which I'm really good with. Um, there's a few things that concern me in ways of, that we could switch wording just a little bit. Uh, on number eight, number eight is the most important to me. I think that we have some issues in the current jail. Um, um, and what they've always been referred to, you guys, and I'm sure this probably isn't a big deal to you, is they've always been called life and safety issues, and you've used the term safety and security. But if, if, if you're all right with that, I think that's a really minor, minor change. Okay. I thought that was amusing. Um, then the next, I would go to item number three which is eliminating or greatly reducing this solitary confinement. Um, this I would have trouble with in that way. I, I do agree with greatly reducing. We do use solitary confinement because other things aren't available at times. However, some solitary confinement is necessary. It is used for, uh, sometimes for suicide watch. It is used for very violent prisoners. Um, in the, the option if we don't have solitary confinement is what? Have a deputy alone? Solitary confinement cannot be eliminated. As much as we would like it to be, it's not possible, I don't believe, to have the word eliminated. So in my mind, I would be fine with greatly reducing. It's a little trivial change 
but it kind of implies we understand that this can't be done to the elimination method. And we greatly appreciate that. Um, I don't know. They want to do it. I'm fine. So once again, since this isn't a proposal, it's good to get everyone's feedback. Um, I don't know if I agree with you um, in the sense that the two examples that you use, and of course, they're just quick examples off the top of your head and not going to hold you to them. But for example, the two examples you used, um, one, an, a, an extremely violent individual. This is not my level of expertise, but to my understanding, solitary confinement exacerbates situations. So if an extremely violent individual is placed in solitary confinement, their mental health state, the way they act, the way they feel, will actually be worse. And maybe you can get him in there, or her in there, but one day you're going to have to take them out, and that is a, you're just making yourself a worse situation. That is my understanding. It may not fully be true, and that's what I like, the idea of having a work study group on this. I want, so, and, and then your second example of a suicide watch, again, Solitary confinement, if you have mental health issues, which you do if you're on suicide watch, that is not a good space. That is yes. not the place to be. That's right. And so, although, again, I appreciate that these are examples off the top of your head. They're not an exclusive list. I don't, I don't, I think that there's merit to eliminating solitary confinement and still keeping our um, officer safe. And I think that a multiple time study needs to prioritize understanding that officers are in there and they work very hard and we have to make sure that they are safe and I'm trying not to do that and that's why I said eliminating or greatly reducing. Um, but I, I think eliminating makes sense sometimes. Sorry. Okay. Some interesting points and, and at this point if we could ask the sheriff since he's here and she's right she's not an expert neither am I but the sheriff is if we could get the sheriff's in Input. Is it possible to eliminate solitary confinement? I think that it's very honorable, and I think that we should move to uh, diminish the use of solitary confinement in its current form uh, to the best that we possibly can. Um, as Supervisor Baird uh, mentioned, there's a host of reasons that we are currently using solitary confinement or administrative confinement um, from its basic method of, of use uh, to change behavior because of behavioral outbursts to the most egregious and those that really border on inhumane uh, behavior and that's to house somebody with a medical condition or a mental health condition or in at least one case that I'm intimately aware of an individual who was sentenced for an extended period of time who because of a medical clients had to be housed in solitary confinement for months. And it's, it's inappropriate, it's inhumane, and it shouldn't be occurring in Dade County. Thank you. Okay. And there, you know, you meant, Supervisor uh, Willett, you mentioned Suicide Watch. There are much, much more humane medical special needs housing units that would be used for an individual who is under uh, deputy watch because of suicidal tendencies or the individual who's acting out, um, most uh, current uh, efficient facilities today have cells, sometimes they're referred to as soft cells, uh, for an individual who's violent to themselves. We don't have one in the income. Okay. Um, I so, I appreciate all of that, and I think there's no one here that doesn't think that we should reduce the use of solitary confinement. And I think that we all also understand that the, that the reason that that's used is because we don't have other choices. Mm -hmm. but the question is, is it possible to not have any solitary confinement cell? You know, we, will, we will have to have some level of administrative confinement cell for an individual uh, who, who, because of behavioral issues, needs to be segregated from the rest of the population. But there are far more humane um, and uh, positive outcome uh, style cells than what we currently have, which are true segregation, solitary confinement cells, where an individual is segregated from sound and human contact. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
and that's what we use every day for between 40 and 50 individuals because of medical and mental health conditions. So is the answer yes, but other solitary confinement? I'm we, not we, need to the create, we need to create other types of administrative housing cells that we don't that don't exist today, but we will always be some level of con separation, uh, confinement, not to the level that we have today with the cells that we have. Supervisor Krause, we haven't had any discussion on an area that you're real interested in, programming in the community and in the jail. So um, we saw a lot of this when we were in Iowa. So go ahead, Supervisor Krause. So one, one of the things that I want to add to the end of the list that I think we need to put some time and money into is working within communities to take a look at what's happening in communities, particularly um, long-standing cultural uh, generations, old at times issues that are causing kids to end up in trouble and see what we can do to help those communities. Um, if, if we, I, I would I would really love to put half the deputies in this town out of work and what I'd really like to do is make them all social workers and send them out into the community. Um, but I think we have a lot of work to do in the community, and if we can work with community and fix a lot of the things in community before, like the, the um, Mickey was talking about the early childhood initiatives and things like that, if we can greatly expand a lot of those things, 
we can keep people out of trouble altogether. And I, I, I would love to do everything we can do to impact that. And I would encourage us to make use of our community experts to help us with that. Okay, thank you. My turn, I guess. Um, I don't wanna, okay. Um, what I'm, um, I'm anxious for us to identify some um, substantial, possibly, changes that could be implemented in the 2016 budget. And uh, I'm gonna pick on Lynn Green a little bit, but she shared with me a statistic that really raised my eyebrows. Basically, over the last 10 years, the amount of money that we're spending on adult mental health, GPR, um, if I remember, was right around eight million. It was the same number 10 years ago. And I, I think if you look at the Mead and Hunt report and you look at what's happening in our community, uh, we have to figure out a way to address the mental health needs of people so that they don't end up in the jail. And so that's a big, big priority with me, um, as is the, the solitary confinement, as is this whole list, actually. This is extremely comprehensive, basically, and um, I don't think we can come up with solutions for everything in the next six months. We also have and I've been trying to reach out so that we really can make change. Um, the judges are all independently elected, as is the sheriff, as is the DA, and they all have independent powers and all of that. So um, what, I, what I'd like to suggest is perhaps um, Supervisor Baird and I should sit down and see if we can do some wordsmithing and bring in the courts, bring in the sheriff, bring in the DA if we need to, bring in Lynn Green. I, I, I don't want to get ahead of us here, but um, I, I'm talking to Lynn, what are the best practices in many of these areas? What are the best practices from around the nation? And we get some work groups together that can identify best practices and actually, I know this seems um, um, quick, but before we get to that 2016 budget, if we can come up with um, some specific things that we could put into the 2016 budget, we could write grants for, um, we could um, you know, facilitate changes in practice and procedures so that problems and we've got to reach out to the other folks that are elected. So if it's okay, um, I'll, I'll, um, we can do that under the open meeting laws. Carousel and I will start wordsmithing, and then we'll, we'll, bring, it, we'll, we'll bring it back at least once more. And um, so that's kind of what I want to do, and I'll call on um, Supervisor Pam.
all on you for a set down with this sort of effect, but I will work with the, and help finesse this, these specific points. Um, uh, I would hope that, um, you know, there are folks probably in the room right now that have a higher level of expertise than the work groups that would um, include some people from the community, that's fine, um, but also some resources that we have in the county, we can look at some of these things and uh, identify best practices and, and, and substantial improvements, um, and we don't, we don't spend any of the $8 million on that, but we, we, we make progress and we don't get in trouble with the bond council. I don't want to do that. I want to spend 90 days arguing with the bond council of whether we can hire a consultant for this or that. I think we are, I, I'm talking to Lynn, I, I think we are going to need a programmatic mental health um, consultant, probably, and I'm, you know, Lynn's trying to help me figure out if we can hire somebody um, locally that can um, pull us together. We, we have county staff, we have a shortage of management people in county staff, so we have to be respectful of who we can pull together that can help us with all of this. I think they're there. Um, this committee has some credibility with other branches of government, and um, I, I've been, um, uh, Judge Cobalt's not here tonight, but I communicated with him over the weekend, and I, I got a, the, the judiciary wants to help, and I've been on this board for a really long time. I wouldn't have gotten that statement 10 years ago, so I, I think we're in a better place. Um, is he here? You said oh, Cobol, not Co Oh, Colos. Excuse me, Cobol is the city. Oh, okay. So, um, anyway, so let's see. Oh, the whole board is up. I'm going to call on uh, Maureen. She hasn't spoken yet. Supervisor Ricardo. Um, thank you, Chair Russ. I would just like to bring up again, as I have in previous meetings, um, the biggest concern that I have uh, with regards to um, the jail situation is the. Um, the safety of all who serve or are being housed in the jail, um, and the responsibility that falls to us um, as the keepers of that and, and to the sheriff's area. Um, we have um, bad situations in the jail. Um, the technology is old and broken. Um, we need to address that, and it costs money to fix it. We know that. Um, if Anything from a fire that we hope never happens to somebody choking on a chicken bone in their cell to, to having a heart attack. Um, <coughs> minutes <coughs> of the essence. And if we can't get a door open because the technology is too old or too decrepit and we have to cut through a bar, it may just be too late. And I, I, I just hate to even think of something like that happening. Um, we, in my mind, I believe that we need to address that first um, and keep people safe regardless of whether we believe they should be there or why they're there or who they are, whether it's the staff or the, or the, the prisoners. But the safety issues in the jail, in my mind, are top priority. It's kind of like, if you can't breathe, it doesn't, don't worry about going on vacation next week, you know? So um, I think that where, I, where my mind is, is something that we need to address first. And I think we can kind of take a breath at that point um, and get into the media or other issues. And it's going to take a long time for a lot of this stuff to, to work through, no doubt. But um, I, I don't think that we can um, leave the issue of the safety and fixing the problems that currently are in the jail regarding safety and the ability to get people in and out. They don't have, they can't just open the door and go. Um, we have to be able to do that. So I think we need to make decisions where we can move quickly to see that done and understand that it needs to be done for the safety of everybody in that jail. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to call on Supervisor Krause because um, I know she's going to have to leave, but go ahead, Supervisor Krause. And the first thing that I was going to say was, as you guys are talking about the list and talking about budget, don't be afraid to talk about 
um, budget amendments for the 2015 budget as well for things that might seem more urgent than waiting for what might happen in 16. Um, the second was I was cool, I would be looking at the amendment agreement for the meat and hunt study and uh, section two in there uh, says the provider shall work with local providers and service organizations with input from consumers, advocates, and the community to explore new and existing community treatment alternatives. And it goes on about that much further. Um, we can strengthen that, I would think, to pull a lot more of the community into um, the $8 million that's existing for the study. And then we wouldn't be in as much trouble with bond people. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that's quite. Um, there, the bond council, and for everybody here, you might, someone who might not know, that means outside attorneys that the county hires to determine whether our bonds are, are legally um, created. So we have to issue bonds to get the money to do anything in regard to capital. And those, that state law says, and federal tax law, that you cannot spend that money on anything but a capital improvement, means stuff building, furnishing sometimes, anything that isn't transitory. So in order to spend money um, out of this $8 million or any capital money um, that we appropriated, the bond council has to, has to go to them and they have to approve it. So they have to tell us, this, it's legal for you to spend this money because this is a capital expense. And I don't have a choice, and the county doesn't have a choice they say no, we don't get the money. Um, and we hire them from an outside uh, law firm, and they're specialized. That's the only kind of law these particular attorneys practice. So it's, we can make these kinds of suggestions, but in general, stuff is stuff, and programs are programs, and bio council sure knows the difference. Well, in, in my mind, what we're talking about here goes directly to the question of what do we need to build in looking at a new jail system? And if and a bond council agrees with that, then we're good. <laughs> but they have to agree with it. These guys are going to have to write that quite carefully then. Right? Well, it, it depends on where the, they're going to look at where the money actually literally goes. And if it goes for stuff or something related to stuff, and they'll look at the percentage of it that goes to deciding what to do in the jail. We can't decide with with capital funds whether to build a jail. We can't we, we can decide what if if we decide to spend the capital funds on the jail, we can look at what the structure of the jail should look like. So that's why Supervisor Pan we had a long discussion on this, and that's why they he and Supervisor Bear created these things, because they think it might be within that um, the parameters of what that jail is going to structurally look like. I can't, I can't address anything problematic. So, so would, would we be able to talk about whether we should consider having a community-based facility for the pre-entry and post-release? I, I think of that's where the beauty of the work groups come in, because of course we can talk about that. We just can't hire somebody out there in La La Land to give us a report on it. With so capital funds. So, so we, we do all this. That's why we're yeah, creating. So we these. can work with Lynn Green and her folks. We can bring in um, some community experts um, that can, you know we can have a work group. That's I'm calling them a work group um, that actually can tackle some of this. Um, and you know the county employees are already paid, and hopefully the community reps. Um, would not be, be, you know, they're community people. They want to help us. You get somebody from the university, maybe, um, that's part of their public service or whatever. Um, we're starting to get um, emails from people and PowerPoints from other communities and all of that. Um, a couple of them came today, and I thought, oh, how nice. Um, you know, so. I mean, the the, um, the the work groups can look look at all that. I mean, there's um, I had a the mental health court. I mean, um, 
Yeah, there's interest from the judiciary on that. Can we, can we pull that together? How many people would, have, you know, um, all that? We, we can really, I think the time is right, and I, I think we, we, we can do a lot. We just can't do it um, where we just put out five or six RFPs. Um, that isn't going to work because we can't use the money for the RFPs. But we are going to creatively get us some help um, um, you know, whatever, and, um, you know, so that's, that's kind of what I'm hoping. Okay, let's see. I think Supervisor Willett and then Supervisor Pan. Supervisor Willett? All right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. The comments that my supervisor to my immediate right, right said are wonderful. The concerns, our first concern is PP and J needs to be to the life and safety issues of the people that are here. All of these are wonderful goals and they are great, but when we start talking about hopefully getting to them by the 2016 budget, that scares me about the life and safety Some of them. Oh, I, I think the health and safety would be identified by the 2000 budget, but, um, I, you know, we're not going to solve the mental health crisis in our community by 2016, but if we can agree on this is really priority one, two, and three, get some of that in the 2016 budget, that's pretty good. Um, yeah, that's worth my go on. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But that's okay. Um, so I think all the other things are good, but I really think that if by the time we put number eight life and safety issues in with them, I'm afraid of what that does to the timing of number eight. Um, I think that life and safety needs to be more than this. <coughs> that needs to be something that we should be getting to now. It, it bugs me that it's already taken as long as it has. We've been studying this for how long? And yet we're still here saying we should find out what the life and safety issues are. So I, I would say that the wording of this, I, you know, I want to tweak it a little bit, but pretty close to what we have. I wanted to say life and safety, and I wanted to say in the CCC, CCB building, um, I think that should be done first. I think it should be done separate so that we get those answers. Those answers are going to come back to the committee, but it's going to get started on that because that is the most important. So I, I certainly a lot of conversations to go on now. I'm very tempted to making a motion to just get the answers to number eight, but I will be quiet for a little while. All right. Thank you, because I think that section is very important, and we have every, um, we do want to move forward on that, but I, I think we need to move forward on a couple of other things in there along with that. Um, it, it's not only this committee that has to go through the full county board process, and I think that if we can make some, you know, we already know what the issues are, we just need a plan. We need long-term, short, long-term and short-term, you know, we need some help on figuring out how to specifically fix those problems that have been I, I identified, you know, and, you know. So, anyway, okay, I promised Supervisor Pan next, didn't I? And I uh, apologize for taking so much time speaking because I hope, I hope we'll move quickly into uh, what the community has to say on some of these issues um, soon. Uh, but I guess I just wanted to uh, clarify a couple points, which is that, you know, I think that, uh, I think Supervisor Krause is correct in that a lot of the recommendations that came from Supervisor Baird and I were, the idea was we wanted to find things that were specifically, uh, potentially could be investigated under um, capital budget, which is, for instance, building an alternative site. So, you know, the, the conversation so far has, has sort of, has a lot of times uh, been, uh, are we building a jail or not, which <coughs> totally um, isn't what, the only things we're discussing, but, you know, and we, we might have made a conversation about can we build an alternative site that, say, could house these kind of services or could provide this kind of service with could be a place where people <coughs> take instead of jail so they don't get up on the record, things like that. Uh, as far as I can tell, that seems to be a capital cost in that. Um, and that capital cost directly affects probably what our steps have to do regarding the 
Anything else to work? Yeah, life and safety. And, and not to interrupt too much, but Human Services recommended that a number of years ago, and the cost was really high. But we need to take another look at that. I mean, that's part of um, the, the yeah, San Antonio, and um, <laughs> you, you, you know, I mean that. You know what? Antonio, they did a lot of nifty things. They had a ton of money. So let's, you know, what fits in Dane County, and I pull the talent together and work on it. Um, but um, you know, we're still going to have to deal with the. We're going to be getting that jail report anytime, um, and you know, right. we're we're violating federal law, yeah. frankly. So right. Yeah, I get it. Um, but, uh, and I think you're right, the cost is really high, but the fact that, um, you know, we had a report that recommended to us building, spending up to $100 something million dollars building the jail, which I know that there are plenty of supervisors here, some of whom don't agree with me, all the points we just brought up, who think that that's, uh, you know, too much money to spend on this sort of thing. So, uh, so I, for me, I think, you know, like, if, if that was at one point on the table, I don't see why not build, uh, you know, investigate and building this facility and figuring out in today's terms what that would cost. Would be, and I think, you know, that um, you know, and this would again have to be worded correctly. But you know, part of investigating such a facility is, that, even in terms of capital costs, you really need to know what kind of services this is being done. What, especially, you know, or, uh, organizations and services provide for the black communities and communities of color, like that. Even though that's programming, that we need to know what exists and what doesn't exist and what needs to exist just to determine what a facility would look like. So, I, I, as far as I can tell, that seems like it would be a capital cost to do that. Um, as far as you know, next steps. Um, you know what I'm hearing is that there are some things that some schools really want to do right now, um, and there are some other next steps that people feel like need more discussion and things like that. And you know, and that people are willing to have community input. And I'm sort of curious as to whether, uh, and this maybe will change based on what the community says, but uh, something to keep in mind is, you know, if we are going to, if we want to. Visible, they need to separate these conversations. Yet, like the very basic nuts and bolts of making sure what the facilities that are running now is is investigated, and then you put together people to investigate uh, alternatives to incarceration and mental health issues and things that will affect the jail population. Um, you know, we want to have a more uh, lengthy process. Then, uh, in that case, I would be glad to uh, open that conversation up to uh, more recommendations that don't just fit into what we thought like, could have been part of the special amendment. And if you wanted to create a work study to tackle that issue as a whole, then you know I think there's there's pages and pages of recommendations that we can add on to the And I think it's in such a way that we really can make some progress. And uh, we're not a university, um, but Mr. Chair, okay, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know what Supervisor Dan is talking about? We have begun exploring already. Uh, when I took office in 2007, we were preparing to build an AODA treatment facility to provide a treatment uh, method to individuals who were incarcerated at that time. And that was put on hold to allow us to further explore electronic monitoring, which has been a highly successful program. We put over 30, over 3,000 people uh, out in their homes on electronic bracelets, which has dramatically decreased jail population over the years and has now proven to be the most successful alternative incarceration program in the history of the sheriff's office. But I did want to touch on the fact that you know there is merit to look at a combined corrections, or jail, and community non-custody treatment option. Um, if you recall, we tried to open up the second floor of the fair center as a homeless shelter and in conjunction with uh, the incarcerated uh, individuals on the first floor. And DOC ruled that we couldn't do that because there was no permanent barrier that, that uh, it, you know, secluded them from correction facility individuals to community members. And so I think there's some merit to exploring that and then maybe reaching out to the EOC to make sure that that's something that could be created where we could have both community-based treatment program for non-custody but also in-custody individuals <coughs> as part of the jail. And we've got part of that done with that AODA treatment yeah. uh, study that was done in 2007. Yeah, I really, it was wonderful that we did the electronic monitoring and that saved millions and millions and millions of dollars. But I can hardly forgive myself that I didn't push harder to also do the AODA then because it would have been 
incredibly cheaper, and a whole bunch of people would have been, in, like, you know, don't cry over water over the dam, but it's like, why didn't we do it then? But we did. So, okay. So we're back to supervisor bear. Very briefly, um, I want to make two quick points. One is um, this is a draft for a reason. If there are things that we need to pull out, then we need to pull them out. I appreciate Supervisor McCarville and Supervisor Willett. If number eight, maybe number eight doesn't really belong here. We don't need to sit and investigate. I, I, I agree. You know, uh, if we have a fire concern, then we have a fire concern. Maybe that needs to be set for resolution and we address it. The second piece is that there are things here that aren't capital, or Supervisor Krause's statement about looking at community involvement and that's not capital, then let's write another proposal. Like we, I don't want us to be bound by fitting into the hole. Like if we don't fit into the piece that we have, then let's make more pieces. Um, and I, I want to let people know that I, I think that makes sense. And the final statement, to be clear, is I'm not interested in wording wordsmithing and playing a vocabulary game so that I qualify for capital. I either qualify for capital or I don't. I don't want any of our efforts to be a game. I don't want any of our efforts to be wordsmithing tricks and if we don't say it the right way it means something else. Let's let's do this right. Okay. Okay. okay, any final comments before we um, we hear from the uh, community? Okay, by the way, I before we hear from the community I think it's unprecedented that we're putting graphs out there. Um, I think this is the first time in these that I know of, I guess sometimes graphs are handed around and stuff, but we've actually been posting for a while. So um, anyway, um, so let's, um, March has got us all organized, right? Um, under the rules of the county uh, board, you, you each have three minutes. Um, and we've got a little bit of a timer, and um, I know when you hear something that you really agree with, it's fun to clap and you know get excited about it. Uh, technically, that's not allowed under the county board rules. So um, I know it's hard, but if you could try and um, just listen real carefully to all the, the speakers and. Um, and we're not going anywhere. I'm gonna, I don't know about the other supervisors. I think most of us can, can stay. And so are we ready for the first one? And you can use either mic. I figured out how to turn you on. Yeah, with either mic. Um, sorry about that. And um, we also, if you put on here, and I, it's seven o'clock already, but if you put on here that you had childcare issues or something like that, Nobody did. Okay, we wanted to move you up to the top. But uh, uh, first person is um, David Blaska, um, to be followed by Catherine, 123 West Washington Avenue, Mulligan, M.U. Mulligan, me. So David Blaska, there. Oh, let me turn you on, David. All power to the people! All power to the people! Then my time starts now. Hopefully I did get those. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Rusk. Uh, as some of you may know, I did serve on this county board for 12 years. Um, and when I first came on this county board in 1994, they were just dedicating the uh, then new public safety building. And uh, believe it or not, conservatives had a majority uh, when they authorized that public safety building, and also when I was elected in 1994. The problem was it was built too small. Uh, we did not have a veto proof majority. We had a majority, but we, so it was compromised. And we wanted to add on two floors, and we could have been uh, roughed in with you know, the HVAC in there, and then you could build it in as the county grew. Unfortunately, and I think Supervisor or Chairman Rusk referred to this, uh, we had then apparently uh, had for many years a kind of a short-term attitude toward things. Uh, I have to say this, that the police in Dane County and the city of Madison are not the problem. They're the solution. They are, and I served uh, for six years on the uh, Public Works Committee. Uh, we spent good money after bad trying to reform and rehabilitate the top two stories of this uh, building here. 
which was, I think, old technology when it was built in 1955. I served on health and human needs. Uh, we have, I think, still well over half of the budget goes for health and human needs. When a police officer goes to a, a place of trouble, whether it's a, a crime scene or a neglect scene or whatever, that person, that family, that those victims get plugged into a very good system. Never has enough money, I understand that. Let me also say that um, unless Sheriff Mahoney wants to correct me, nobody's in the Dane County Jail for stealing a $10 coat. That's just not happening. That is not the case. I have to say, too, that I've heard a lot here tonight about worrying about the inmates, which is fine. I understand that. In fact, uh, I think Sheriff Mahoney is, is very progressive in the, in the best possible way with a, with a small P, in that he, in that he has, in, you have a, a captive population, obviously. You can give them services, you can give them help, but they may not have access, whether it's aorta issues or whatnot. Uh, that's some place where you can do something. What I haven't heard, though, is protecting the community. Someone here said crime is down, they can't figure out why crime is down, and the inmate population is up. I, I suggest cause and effect. I think the bad people are taken off bad from the community and put in jail. That helps the good people of that community to coalesce, to go to school, to study, to go to work, to not be afraid in their own homes, to save for a better future. We owe a debt to the people of Dane County who are trying to play by the rules. The problem with folks in the jail is not poverty, and I, I resent this black versus white business that's being foisted. We, don't, we cannot have two separate but unequal justice systems. The problem is not race, the problem is poverty, the problem is behavior. That is the problem. And so I say to you that, all right, well thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate that. All right, thank you. Um, next is Catherine Oh. You're absolutely correct. I got one already. Okay. Um, okay, wait, this one too. Registering our position. Did you give me the wrong pile? No. Registering our position. Alright, here's the speaker. Um, M. Adams, A D A M S. Yes! All power to the people! All power to the people! Uh, quickly, uh, we are continuing to push for our demands. We are against all monies to be that go to building a new jail as well as putting money in jails to build new parts of jails, <coughs> which we also consider to be new jails. Yes. We also demand an end to solitary confinement, and we also demand the immediate release of 350 black people who are incarcerated due to crimes of poverty and structural racism uh, here in Dane County. Quickly to say, there are people incarcerated um, in the jails due to crimes of poverty. There are people incarcerated who cannot afford to pay uh, simple bills. And they are only in there because they can afford a bill of $200, $300, or uh, money similar to that. Secondly, I'd also like to say, uh, policing has a lot to do with that. People don't walk themselves into jail. Police go and get those people and take those people Hell out yes. to the jail. People don't just wake up and say, oh, I'm going to walk into jail. No, people are picked up by the police. So the police have a direct responsibility in people being in jail. And I am disappointed in the leadership of the police that would say we don't have a role because my understanding of leadership means that you are responsible for yourself and the entity in which you lead. Preach. Which means Preach. that the leadership of the police should be saying, yeah, we did do that. Let's do something different. Yes. Um, also, uh, quickly on the subject of the jail, um, we wanted in writing that the sheriff is not going to build a new jail. Um, I do not, I'm not going to just take people saying we don't have the money now, so we're not going to uh, build a new jail. We wanted in writing, we wanted in a, uh, a moratorium, and we also understand that uh, if all of the reconstruction goes in for the jail, that when that new jail is, when that jail is completely reconstructed, that that would end up costing more. Uh, to build it more yes. money for reconstruction than the building of Eden the jail. Yes. Page 28. Uh, also, in the, in the, on the subject of capital money, there are tons of infrastructure that needs to be built in the black community which this money could fund. Owl Creek, for an example, is a neighborhood, is a community of predominantly... One minute. 
predominantly low-income families that do this that does not even have a community center. Mm -hmm. There's eight million dollars here for capital funding. There's a poor community, a black community, without a community center. Go and build a community center. Yeah. I've heard time and time again that there was no money. Clearly, there is money. We will not be fooled by these uh, stories that say there's no money, that there's no resource. We are here demanding that people do what is right, that people do what is just. Lastly, there is no shortage of well-intended well -intended white people. This is not a conversation of what you meant to do or how you like black people or how many black friends you have, to be clear. This is not a conversation of do you like me or not. I am not here to discuss that. I am here to discuss impact, period. Eight to one arrest records, period. Yes. 5.9% black county, 49% black jail. We are here to deal with impacts and impacts alone. Yes. We support the majority of the resolution and the draft put forward by Leland and uh, Carousel, but we once again are against the monies being invested in jails. Yeah! Yeah! We yeah. even left them with 10 people, seconds. Build the people, not the jail! Build the people, not the jail! Build the people! Build the people. Okay, so you guys <laughs> All right. Um, next, we have Randy Grayson, North Avenue, to be followed by Sandy Wellander on Fisher Street. So, Randy. All power to the people. All power to the people. The Young, Gifted, and Black Coalition oppose any money for jail or rebuilding of the jail. We demand a people's injunction on the proposed $8 million for remodeling or building a new jail, and that money to be reallocated to black-led resources. Yes. We de demand the release of 350 black people incarcerated due to crimes of poverty that we like to pretend that doesn't exist. We demand the end of solitary confinement. It is inhumane. If you, you need to house someone with mental health issues, find them a place that's not in solitary confinement. Let's go. I just want to say that the truth is, is that by adding floors to the building, the public safety building, you are adding 186 beds. The truth is, by doing so, it will cost the taxpayers of Dan County $160 million based on the report that you provided us. The truth is, you will not do, you will not be doing anything to address the racial disparities that currently plague our system. The truth is, you only waste time and money by continuing to invest in institutions and systems that do not benefit our community. Yeah. We are here because we are black. We are here because we live in these communities that you tend to continue to speak for and enforce policies and procedures and allocate funds that have nothing to do with our needs. We're tired of you specifically telling us what we need. We do not need more policing. We do not trust you in our neighborhoods. We do not trust you because we have hundreds of years of a history of you murdering and harassing us. When you police our communities, you are basically looking for probable cause to harass us. White people do not deal with that in their communities. You can sit on the corner and smoke crack and nobody knows and nobody cares, which leads to the high racial disparities in our jails. Yes. There is a problem. Black people in Madison is arrested at a rate of six to one. 45% of the people in jail are in jail for bonds and bail lower than $1,000. If they had money, they would be gone. Let's so therefore, go. this is not a public safety issue or issue relating to the safety of our communities. We are tired of you telling us what we need. We are tired of you getting on the media and mainstream media reframing our agenda and making us look angry. You damn right we're angry. Yes. You damn right we're angry. We are justified in our anger. I am sick of being harassed by police. I am sick of being assumed that I am a criminal and I am lazy and I don't have the intellectual ability to the self-determination for me and my people and create the environments that we deserve and that we desire. Your presence in our neighborhood is an issue. Yes. We do not need white men on horses patrolling us. Yes. We do not need people arresting us because we decide to hang out because that's what we do with culture. Oh, we do not know. need you telling us that we cannot hang in our parks, that we cannot sit on our porches, that we cannot do the things that you as white people get to do. And if, if you're not aware, this is definitely a race issue. Check the statistics, baby. It doesn't happen by itself. We are the worst in the nation. We are the worst across the state. And it's because of people like you sitting on these boards that have no clue about what it means to be black in America. And we will not stand for you making decisions for us anymore. We will not stand for you mocking us and whispering and making these comments behind our, 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 our backs. We are here and we ain't going nowhere until you answer and respond to our demands in a, in a way that, that incorporates our vision for ourselves and our community.
and it's all power to the people. Woo!
The baby steps are not enough. Come on now, let's go. Okay, the problem is very deep. I mean, uh, somebody quoted uh, at the rally uh, uh, earlier uh, what Michelle Alexander said, which is that more black people are under the, are under the clutches of the criminal injustice system mm. than were in child slavery mm. in 1850. Come on. Let that sit That's here. a fact. And this county Look leads the pack in its per capita contributions to that statistical representation of oppression. This body, by purpose or neglect, is responsible for at least a significant part of that destructive reality. That's right. You have an opportunity now to disprove the growing notion that you sit on a body whose claim to democracy is counterfeit. <laughs> Come on now. There have been repeated mobilizations asking you to stop the jail study and instead redirect the $8 million towards community-led programs that build the people and not the jail. Yes! The amazing work done by the Young, Gifted, and Black Coalition has forced some statements indicating a change of heart made. We need this body to inject itself Injunct itself against any present or future measures to expand rather than contract the warehousing of black people for crimes of poverty. Yes. We need this in writing because we are too used to politicians yes. sweet talking us about climate change. Yeah. Okay, no matter what they're called. <laughs> I have yet to hear about similar repeated demonstrations in defense of this jail study. Mm. So is this democracy or is it a charade? Mm. And if my comments are too sharp for you in my defense, I was here in June as part of the 15 Now Coalition uh, demanding that you amend the advisory uh, referendum for the minimum wage to call for a living wage of $15 an hour instead of the measly 10-10. Right. Yeah. Which, by the way, is also a key issue of racial justice. Yeah. That's right. Because black and brown workers are concentrated in low wage work. Let's go. Okay. Right. At that meeting, a crushing majority of speakers supported 15, and you guys went ahead with 10-10. Mm. Okay. Uh, and so I wonder if the uh, you know corporate overlords that rule this this county and this city have the same amount of trouble uh, being heard for their demands. Yeah. So are you a democratic body or are you not? If you are, you should stand with the people and say, build the people, not the jail. Yes! Yes! So the reference was made to this uh, bond council of some lawyers, an uh, outside uh, law firm. Hmm. What law firm exactly is this? <laughs> Who are their clients? Yeah. And what are their interests? Yeah. The law all too often is not the law as such and is interpreted to serve corporate and financial interests above those of democracy and human That's rights. Right. Yeah. Elizabeth Bruno to be followed by Eric Upchurch. Elizabeth? Okay. Eric Upchurch to be followed by <coughs> Joan Eagle. All power to the people. All, All power, power to, to the people. people. You're Eric, right? Yes, I am. Okay, I do. Uh, so really quickly, as part of the Young Gifted and Black Coalition, we are against all monies to renovating or adding to a jail, jail study, um, uh, or a new jail. Um, we demand that that $8 million be put towards community, black community-led initiatives, uh, that 350 black people be released, uh, those who are incarcerated due to crimes of poverty, and an immediate end to solitary confinement. Um, there are some mutual concerns here, and uh, I would like to believe that people here want what's best for our community. Where we differ is how we enact those results. And I think that if you're wanting to affect a community, you need to listen to that community and you're hearing from them tonight. Um, we feel like we, we want to address crimes in our communities. Where there is an unsafe overflow area in the jails. Uh, in the jail, we recognize that. We have a solution. Don't put people there. Don't put people in those unsafe areas. Yes. If you were at capacity, would you put people in random corners and just seal it off and hope that it, it suffices? No, you wouldn't. Don't put people there. And if that means no arrest, don't arrest people. Um, the, we also mutually want an end to solitary confinement. Um, solitary confinement exacerbates the issues in mental, of mental wellness. This is not pillow talk, people. This is uh, from the National Alliance on Mental Illness. 
So That's this cool. is not something. So to say that you have to put somebody in solitary confinement is to say that you have to exacerbate their issues. And then if you're arresting people because of their mental, or related to their mental illness, you are in fact contributing to the high arrest rate of those people incarcerated due to crimes of poverty and also to their mental illness. So you're, in short, you're creating a problem and then asking for funding to pay for a solution okay. that you are also oh. creating. Uh, that seems counterproductive uh, to me. One minute. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> jail does not solve our root causes. Um, we want to focus on alternatives and focus on uh, addressing these racial disparities. If you really want to address racial disparities, then let's focus on those. The, the group that you pay, Meet and Hunt, to uh, give you these statistics, um, they also said that um, that in their master plan, their master plan predicts that space needs would increase by 186 beds uh, in the coming years, pending no policy change. Mm. So this plan, that you, the people that you're paying to get your information from, are telling you that your plan is not working. Mm. So what that means is that we need another plan, and the community has that plan. Listen to the community. Mm -hmm. um, what we need to ask ourselves is, is the jail and criminal justice system a place for human services? It is not. Obviously, it is contributing to our issues per me and hunt the people that these that our community uh, our officials have paid. Um, so what we want is to focus on the root causes. Um, there's talk about the capital Can budget not being able to be used for um, community initiatives. That's we've heard that that's a lot. You can, Fund studies, and those studies can go to all sorts of community programs. It needs to go to black-led community initiatives because we are the ones most impacted. <coughs> listen go. to us, because obviously, listening to yourselves, coming from a well-meaning and ignorant perspective, well-meaning and ignorant perspective, it's not working. So let's learn from our mistakes and move forward. All, all right. <laughs> Last name right, and after Joan is Andrew Glickner. Chairman Russ, supervisors, and fellow citizens. I am Joan Legal, and I am a member of Naomi Dane County and of Moses. I have no official capacity with either group, but I am here tonight, and I'm going to start with a story. The story begins in 1841. The main character is Dorothea Dix. Dorothea is a school teacher who has decided to teach Sunday school at a jail in Massachusetts. When she arrives, what she sees changes her life, and eventually she will change the lives of many other people because of it. She sees women who are clad in dirty rags and housed in a cold room. One woman is in a cage. Dorothea goes to court with her case, and she wins warmth for those women. She begins a campaign to inspect jails throughout the eastern part of our United States, and eventually uh, convinces legislators to build asylums for people who have serious mental illness. In her lifetime, she's responsible for building 32 asylums. <coughs> now the next chapter, the, uh, or the next chapters actually, of the story, we know well. In the 70s and, and maybe perhaps early in the 60s, we decided that asylums weren't the answer. Psychotropic drugs had been discovered, the early ones. It was possible to move some people from the asylums into the community. The plan was to have the money follow those who moved into the community. However, the funds never fully arrived. Then homelessness of the mentally ill began to increase. And that system uh, brings us to where we are today. We've gone full circle. We're back, and instead of cages like Dorothea saw, we have solitary confinement. Oh, same thing. So, so let us write 
another chapter. Let us write a chapter and let us have the theme be mental illness is not a crime. Jails are not therapeutic environments. No new jail. Instead, let us look at national trends. I mentioned again. Oh, all right. Time's up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, I think you have a message, and let's move forward. All right. Followed by Colleen Donahue, Donahue or Donahue? Andrew, Andrew here. No, Andrew, Colleen on 2105 Kendall Avenue. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, for every dollar spent on treatment alternatives and divisions, diversions, um, saves a dollar ninety-six to the taxpayers. There's been a lot of studies already identifying um, best practices, and um, Dane County is not using them. And without utilizing those and figuring out what our prison population truly needs to be, we don't know how big the prison has to be. So it doesn't make sense to build a prison first. Um, I have to say that I'm quite ignorant about a lot of these issues. I adopted three African American kids who I love passionately. And hearing what's happening in Dade County being the worst place for black people um, breaks my heart. I either have to move to Sweden or become active and try to make the world a better place for them because they deserve it. They're amazing. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Elizabeth Severson to be uh, followed by Nino Rodriguez. Elizabeth? Yes. Oh, okay. sorry. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I'm here um, in support of the Young Gifted and Black Movement. Um, as I read their list of demands a couple weeks ago, I got so excited and the, the chance to come here and say something to this committee um, was just very exciting for me. I think that Dane County has a chance to do something so exciting, so new, so progressive by not investing dollars in a jail or a jail addition, but to go to the people who can identify the issues and come up with some marvelous ideas, all different ideas, on how to solve some of the problems. With $8 million, I know it's not a ton of money, but what if some great programs come out of this and then more money is generated for the African American community in Dane County and then it spreads. And if it means that there are fewer young black men in jail, it will be absolutely wonderful. I work with um, a very small group of people, um, and we send books to prisoners in um, the state of Wisconsin. We get letters from the prisoners. They say, send me this kind of book. The letters primarily come, we get an enormous number of letters from African American males, obviously because they make up the majority of our prisons. Their stories are heartbreaking and heartwarming and can you send me a book on algebra? Can you send me a book on taking my GED? Um, the idea of helping, giving of that money, going to a group of people who will say, how about this program? How about that program? Here's what we can do. Um, we can have a, a, a baby, a, a parent school, or a parent college like they did in Brooklyn. I mean, so people are going to come up with some marvelous ideas, and I can't wait to see what the African American community of Dane County comes up with. Thank you.
advocating uh, against spending any of this money on new jail or new jail facilities. So I wanted to just maybe re reflect a little bit on, uh, we're coming up on uh, Martin Luther King Day on Monday, uh, and thinking about uh, what, what, does, uh, what does the situation look like? How is it different uh, since, uh, since the time that uh, Dr. King was uh, organizing? So you don't see now, you don't see the signs right uh, above places that say white only. You don't see signs on uh, the drinking fountain or above the door. And in fact, when you came in here tonight, you saw a nice big Martin Luther King on the door as you came in. But I think what we've, what we've heard from people is that you know, the, the signs still exist, those white only signs still exist. They're just, uh, they're concealed, they're hiding, they're written into policies, they're part of practices that lead to the problems that we've seen with over-incarceration, particularly of black folks and people of color. Um, and part of what I want to do is just encourage you to look for those signs, figure out where they are, where are they hiding in the policy. And I'm here to help you a little tonight. I brought some signs with me. So, for example, one sign. We've been talking about uh, trying to get people out who can't afford to pay the bail or who cannot pay the bail uh, that are very low well amounts. Well, how, how do people end up in a situation where they're getting bail uh, instead of getting released on their recognizance instead of getting a signature bond? Well, here's a sign. A sign that says, you know, from the Wisconsin courts on how it is that people get bail or not. And one of those signs is that you have to have a proper identification. Okay, so one thing we know about people who are struggling with low incomes, one thing we know about people who are struggling with low incomes is that it's difficult to maintain identification. We have certainly saw a big discussion about that in terms of uh, changes to voter registration and that sort of thing. People are marching in the streets because they don't have voter, they don't have identification or the means to identify. That's poverty. That's one Talk reason that people it. don't get bail. That's one reason that they sit in the jail right here above our heads and down the street. So that's a sign. Another sign, when the county tried to implement an alternative to bail program, here's a sign, a sign from the state attorney general at the time saying that counties were not allowed to run these sorts of programs. The sign that I would like to see and the reason for that is because there's no law saying that a county can run that kind of program. I would like to see a new sign, a new law, an ordinance saying counties can run bail alternative programs. I'll leave my Thanks. remarks there. Thank yes. you. All power to the people! All power to the people! Corey Larson, he's followed, followed by my former neighbor, Ted Goat Jr. Oh, Corey. Oh, Corey. Hi. Uh, my name is Corey. I'm a unionist and a socialist. I'm in solidarity with the Young, Gifted, and Black Coalition. Woo uh, we demand an injunction. People's injunction has proposed $8 million for remodeling or building a new jail and for that money to be reallocated to black community led resources. We demand the release of 350 black people incarcerated due to crimes of poverty from the Dane County Jail. We demand the end of solitary confinement. We demand the release of 350 black people incarcerated for crimes of poverty. Uh, these are crimes like homelessness, like drugs, like theft. Um, in Dane County, 54% of blacks are in poverty. Let's go. 75% of black children are in poverty. Okay. Same. Black unemployment is 25%. So we must also demand an end to poverty. Yes. In the richest country in the world, in the richest city in this state, poverty itself is the crime. Let's go. There are more empty houses in this country than homeless people. So how can you end homelessness in this county? Put them in the houses. Come on. Come on. Voters voted to legalize marijuana in this county. Although it was a non-binding referendum, the police should uh, stop harassing, ticketing, and arresting people for drug use. Come on. Right on. And if you want to end theft, give people living wage jobs. Yes. It should be a crime to pay a wage that people can't live on. Yes. Say that. To combat poverty, we should spend the 140 million or 170 million or whatever this new jail costs on green jobs, retrofitting old inefficient houses, creating mass transit that can actually get people to work on time, yes. building wind and solar power, 
and stop the criminal rate charges and changes by MGE. Yeah. There's always money for hotels, for condominiums, for State Street developments, for tax breaks for greedy corporations who pay poverty wages. There's always money for the police and sheriff's department, for military vehicles. One minute. Mm -hmm. And if the money, uh, hold on, I already said that. <laughs> While we're working on these solutions, taking the money from the people who don't need it and giving it to black communities to lift themselves up, Police need to stop harassing, ticketing, and harassing poor people and people of color. In New York City, a police protest and slow down against anti-racism and for the right to brutalize and murder blacks in the street. For two weeks, reduced arrests 60%, reduced summonses 90%, and saw no increase in crime. The NYPD claimed it was only doing its necessary work. The police in Dane County in the state of Wisconsin should only do the necessary That's right. Work. Let's go. And we should immediately release all prisoners for crimes of poverty. Build the people, not the jail. Thank you. Build the people, not the jail. Build the people, not the jail. Build the people, not the jail. Ted? I don't see Ted. Um, so we'll go on to Matthew. Carney to be followed by Carl Sack. Thank you. Yeah. Build the people, not the jail. Yes. yes. To believe that use of scarce public resources to build a new jail is the less wise investment rather than the more wise investment is not necessarily an anti-police position or an anti-law enforcement position. There's lots of reasons that I can't explain in three minutes why. Uh, it's in the long-term interest of law enforcement to decrease reliance on the incarceration model. Not to mention in the long-term interest of the communities that are policed to decrease reliance on the incarceration model. Um, it's going to be better, ultimately. The, why are we tying so much, why are we talking about racial disparities and mass incarceration in relation to this particular decision to build a new jail? It's because once we spend a substantial amount of money, 8 million, 140 something million, whatever amount it is, to build a new jail, there will be a strong impulse to use it. It will help to keep us into the incarceration model of dealing with community problems, of dealing with uh, small crimes, of dealing with, in many cases, non-crimes, process violations, uh, failure to show up for a court date and you get locked in jail, uh, failure to pay a bond in a timely manner and you get locked in jail. Failure to, uh, uh, you get, you're on probation and you stay out past curfew and you get locked in jail. And the list goes on and on and on. Um, the county, Dade County, as we all know, I think, has one of the highest rates of racial disparity in incarceration in the entire world. Yes. And there are solutions. There's not, they can't be, they can't be covered in three minutes, but there are solutions. We can, at the very least, although we, we're not, we're probably not going to solve that problem tonight. We're probably, we're definitely not going to solve the deep cultural association of blacks with criminality tonight. Yeah. So yeah. ultimately, we must solve it. But we can, at the very least, not make the situation the local situation. We can, at the very least, not make the local situation worse by building a new jail. Yes. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Followed by Karma Chavez. Um, I'm here to stand in solidarity with the Young Gifted Black Coalition and Woo. the incredible uh, energy that they have brought to this issue of racial disparities in Dane County. We had a report, and it's easy enough to, for reports to come out and then just be ignored, and they're making sure it's not going to be ignored, and they deserve all of our thanks for that. Uh, everyone's in the community. Uh, I want to say, I, I want to uh, acknowledge the draft that was brought uh, by the supervisors, Pam and Baird, um, and say that there appear to be some good ideas in there, but I, I think, I want to ask, does it meet the demands? Right. Mm -hmm. I want to ask, uh, where in there the month that eight million dollars is being sent to communities of color organizations to determine what to do with that money for themselves. Yes. And I think that yes, we need to look we getting rid of solitary confinement, 
great. Get rid of solitary confinement. As inhuman, no one should ever have to be subject to solitary confinement. But we need um, consultation of the communities that are experiencing this day to day. When we say we need um, this plan, you know, whatever plan we come up with should be, you know, should hire somebody to look at it who has some outlook on racial justice. You don't need to hire anybody. Go to the South Side, go to Owl Creek, hold community meetings, get the there, and make you a plan, and right. then do it. That's right. And about this this bonding committee or whatever it is, um, what you need a, a pass needs to pass a muster with a capital uh, for a capital bond. There's no impor more important capital in this city than the human capital. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. There's no more important capital than human capital, or whatever you want to call it. I hate the term capital, but you know, let's use it for this because those are the communities that have to deal with the outcome, and that's who should be directing this plan. Right on. Are you the elected officials, or are some lawyers who decide whether to dole out bonds or not? Build the people, not jails. That's right. Catherine Gray. Catherine Gray. Um, Erica Bach. ACH. Okay, great. And then after Erica will be. Um, Danielle Bailey. Thank you, Board of Public Protection and Judiciary. I am honored to be here tonight with Madison organizing in strength, equality, and solidarity. We stand in solidarity with the Young, Gifted, and Black Coalition, as well as several other community organizations who are here tonight to once again say to you, no new jail, and no old jail either. Oh. We, the citizens of Dane County, and members of MOSES demand urgent fixes to all levels of Dane County's criminal justice system. Dane County has some, as you know, of the nation's worst incarceration rates of African Americans, intolerable use of solitary confinement, including of people with mental illness, and a great deal of unnecessary incarceration caused by outdated policies and practices. We thank Supervisors Baird and Pan for the changes and reforms suggested to the criminal justice system. While they are still attached to $8 million for jail renovations, we cannot fully advance that agenda. That's right. Sheriff, with all due respect, if we can't have your department fix an antiquated door for the safety of the people inside, why would we trust you with $8 million? We have no reason to believe that you have our community's safety in mind. Talk that talk. The jail is an antiquated building, and the system is a broken one. We need to look at options, including treatments, alternatives, and diversions. You heard earlier that $1 spent equals $1.96 in change. Yes. It also equals the support of community members. It means lifting up the voices of those who are locked within. Yes. Tad, over the course of the last two years, has saved a total of 141,215 jail days. Come on now. We need to continue to invest in these types of options. Counties save money when jail use is decreased, and participants have a lower recidivism rate than people who are sent to jail or prison for the same offenses. A pre-painted solitary cell is still a solitary cell. Come on. Since we agree that it is inhumane, let's refrain from treating humans. That is our neighbors, our families, and our communities in any way that is less than human. Let's go. Thank now. you. No new jail, no old jail either. That's Woo! right. All power to the people. All, All power, power to the people. people. Danielle Bailey to be 
followed by Ann Cooler. Hello, my name is Danielle Bailey. I'm employed by the YWC of Medicine and also by Domestic Abuse and Prevention Services. I am here in solidarity with the Young Gifted and Black Coalition. We're calling for a people's injunction of the proposed $8 million to further renovations of or building of a new county jail. We recognize an injunction is normally defined as a court demanded order that requires a party to refrain from specific action. While not court ordered, we call on the PPNJ to put a hold on the $8 million while a plan is put together to spend it for the building, it for building the wall and not the jail, to reallocate it to black community-led programs or black community-led stuff, and find ways to keep people out of jail first. Yes. We demand for an injunction of the proposed $8 million for remodeling or building a new jail and for the money to be reallocated to black community-led resources. We demand the, resources, the release of 350 black people incarcerated due to crimes of poverty from the Dane County Jail. We demand the end of solidarity, so, of solitary confinement, the elimination of solitary confinement. Um, to add to that, my grandfather was a police chief of his um, hometown, and I know for a fact that he has racist bias and unconscious racist bias because mm. he raised my father, who has racist bias and unconscious racist bias, who raised me. Mm. And I, as a white woman who grew up in Madison, have racist bias and unconscious racist bias, Come and on that's now. what I'm talking about, Come on. and that's what we're talking about. Okay. Also. Yeah. I live on Monroe Street. I work on Monroe Street and I go to school on Monroe Street. I also work on the south side. I can tell you the exact moment when I know I drive from my neighborhood, my mm. white neighborhood, into the south side of Madison because of the number of police oh, cars that are there. Yes. Come on. Right. And when I take a U-turn in my community, there's no problem. But when I take a U-turn in, my, <laughs> in right. the south side of Madison, right. and the police officer pulls up behind me and waits for my face to show up in that mirror, mm. and my face shows up in that okay. mirror as a white woman, and then they <coughs> drive away. Come on now. He wanted to intimidate me first, and then when he saw me, my white face and my new car, he drove away. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Ann Cooler to be uh, followed by Carol Rubin. Uh, yes, hi, thanks. Um, I am with Moses, um, with the Moses Jail Task Force, and we have concerned citizens who have been working very hard all these months to learn more about the Dane County uh, criminal justice system and uh, the jail situation. And uh, I also teach philosophy, and I have to say there's this uh, abysmal uh, uh, disconnect um, where people are talking past each other, and I'm afraid that we're going through this empty uh, theater of citizens um, protesting and talking about uh, uh, alternatives to jail uh, instead of these um, proposals to build new jails or remodel old jails to add new beds. The disconnect with that is the concern for the safety of the people inside the city county building, right, which was built in 1956. We know that there are some jails that lock, and people are not putting those two pieces together. I'm sorry, there are some locks that stick. The disconnect is the realization that the number of locks that actually stick in the city county building only involve about 20 prison, about 20 yes. cells, or 20 uh, people in that jail. We have 74 empty beds in the Huber facility Ooh. right now. Mm. There are empty beds in the city county building. I saw them. Mm. <laughs> They're, they're take a tour. It, you know what else? It is not all that bad a building. I have read the 637-page uh, Mead and Hunt report. Mm -hmm. I have read their description and their photographs of the physical of the physical facilities, and it is not as bad as the housing that a lot of people in this in this city live in. Ooh. Come on. The point is that because you have some sticky old locks that can't be fixed and can't be replaced for 20 people in the city county building jail does not mean you build a new jail. Perspective. Does not yeah. mean you add four floors to the mm, city county public, public service building. The disconnect is right there. That's why we're all saying to you, no, no, no. First you stop unnecessary incarceration. That's right. Yeah, that's Today, right. this week. Right now. In we mm -hmm. weeks, in weeks. You could get people out of those locks that stick. Mm. There's no need for most people to be in this jail. Right. That's why we're saying, first, 
You stop unnecessary incarceration, which we are doing every single day here. You stop the unnecessary incarceration. Mark Hoover just started a bail loan program, a private one, to get past the uh, 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 state law. Mm -hmm. He just started it with the public defender and the DA a couple weeks ago. They're already stopping people from going into jail with a bail loan program. They're trying to get more funding for it. There are 25%, there are 24% of the people in Dane County Jail, according to the Meat and Hunt data, are eligible for Huber. 25% of them out of about uh, beds of about, I don't know what the beds are. 150 people. It's only 20 beds where the lock stick. There were empty beds elsewhere. Things can be fixed. And solitary use has a lot to do with our jail's policies. Let me tell you. Let's go. Time's up. They could be changed soon. Yes. All right. All power to the people. All power to the people. Okay. Carol, go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm a member of Moses. Um, as the prior two speakers, I think, were. I wasn't going to speak tonight, but I have two things I need to say. One is in, in uh, response to the first speaker tonight who talked about the bad people in jail. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I think of my uh, friend who spent 200, a total of 230 days in the Dane County Jail because DOC issued a warrant for his arrest for a GPS system maintained by DOC, which doesn't work. Yeah. He was never charged. 230 plus days in the mm. Dane County Jail. Wow. So I want to hear about all the bad people in the Dane mm. County Jail. Let's go. Yes. Um, secondly, I got a letter from uh, a friend who's in jail today who uh, enclosed the collection notice from the collection agency for his court fees. I think they were for $280. And of course, he went from the Dane County Jail, uh, from the Dane County Court, immediately to prison, where he's been, and he doesn't have money. And now he has a collection action out for the Dane County Court fees. And when he gets out soon and applies for employment, they'll probably do a credit check on him. And he's got an outstanding, uh, you know, amount of money. So that's just one example of the cycle of how the poverty feeds into itself. Why would Dane County, you know, put out a collection notice for someone who they know has been sitting in jail ever since they convicted him of a nonviolent crime? Thank you. That's all the slips we have. Oh, I anybody? Yeah, okay, tell us your name. Bev Boer. Um, go ahead and Bev talk. Okay, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I just want to say that I appreciate everyone who is here tonight, you know, and all the work and thought that you're putting into this. And um, I've learned some things from the testimony. I appreciate that. And I also want to say that I am here tonight in solidarity with the Young Gifted and Black Coalition. Um, they got me out of my chair tonight and down here. And I appreciate that leadership and that vision of how important it is to change where we're headed and what we've been doing and to get up and to just jumpstart us a little to stop defending you know, the way we always do things and the way things are done and get some of these creative, more creative ideas coming up. And I don't understand all of this stuff, you know, um, but I do, I did get an article um, about um, the um, monitoring program and I really appreciate that that's helped decrease the number of people in jail. But I understand one of the problems with that is that again, that's disparate impact. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because mm -hmm. people of color don't get aren't getting out of jail. That's right. And who are eligible for this aren't getting out of jail with this monitoring program. So that's just one thing I didn't hear get said, um, but I thought I wanted to add, and, and I certainly want to piggyback on what Carol said about the people in jail. You know, there are, there are fathers and 
mothers and brothers and family members. There are people that need to be with their families, and the communities will actually be safer if they're with their families and they can go to work. One minute. And and they can earn money and they can build relationships in the community. Our community will actually be safer on getting these people out of jail. That demands that we're talking about here. So. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All Thank right. You. So you miss somebody else? Yes, I can. Come on up. Come on up. Um, tell us your name. You feel like you said? I did. Okay. okay. We're so just in the wrong here. pile. Here, what's your name? Joan Durst. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, I'm Joan Durst. Um, I'm older. I'm seasoned. And I'm a white. <laughs> and I grew up in white Madison. And my ancestors made sure that I was segregated from people of color and Native Americans. And now I am still being segregated mm. because we are locking up our black and other people of color citizens. Mm. And so I am really um, pleased to be here with young, gifted, and black to hear that their voices are being heard, or being said in this body. And I appreciate, I guess I appreciate Sheriff Mahoney for showing us that we have a crisis in our um, county, so that it has brought about this conversation. And we have PPNJ, sorry I can't get all the right. You got it right. Okay, and, and the thoughts that you have given to this, and the struggle that you are having to, to decide, you know, how do we keep the prisoners safe? And yet, how do we look long term? And um, we've heard from Young Gifted in Black already, um, the 350 that could be set free. Um, another place that it seems we have a lot of people that have to go through our jail doesn't necessarily have to do with our county but the Department of Corrections, how do we work with them so that people who are on parole, probation, do not have to be housed in a holding pattern when there's some um, thing that happened that has to do with their parole violation, not a crime. Right. That the, there are thousands of people like that who go through our county jail yeah. every year. We don't need that. <coughs> so thanks to PPNJ, thanks for um, Young, Gifted, and Black, and thanks um, for bringing this conversation to our community. Let's, let's all be one and keep this segregation from our um, brothers and sisters, our children, our grandchildren in the future. Thank you. room as we've shown in the past gosh three four meetings we have everything we would need to create a work group or just something to be at the table and talking about solutions that are equitable for the communities that are experiencing it folks here in this room are the experts so um, really I just want to conclude by saying how how happy I am as a white person to see other white folks who are stepping up um, indeed white capitalist power structures really rely on that deception um, and deceiving white folks about the idea, the societal construct of race. Well, hopefully you all have seen that for some of the white folks in this space. We're self-selecting out of that myth, that mm. bullshit. All right, so that's really all I want to say. Thank you, Sheriff. I want to know that <laughs> if you continue to, to walk and move with integrity, white folks will stand behind you. Maybe not all of them. You know, there's some bad actors, but we will stand behind you. So keep up the continue the good work. Thank you, Karis. Folks for listening as yes. well and giving different input as well. So, um, all power to the people. All power to the people. Okay. And looking around, did we miss anybody? Okay. All right. Motion to adjourn. Moved by Supervisor Baird, seconded by Supervisor Pan, that we adjourn the meeting. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs> oh, I got a part of the ticket. <laughs>